I'm Judy Oswitz, and I have Terrapin Farm, which is kind of a farm to market road a ways, kind of near Olney. We're in the Olney Bissell district, we say, and we have a challenging climate. Um, you'll, you'll see a little bit more about how challenging it is, but um, how many of you all grow seeds? How many of you select seeds? You're, li you're like, you're not just like, oh, here's all my tomatoes, I'll harvest all the seed from them. You choose which ones you want. Great, a few people are, who wants to do seeds that isn't doing them yet? Okay, and tell me one more thing. Who's got a growing season longer than 75 days? <laughs> sort of. Sort of, I'm in the Thompson Falls. Ooh, okay. <laughs> good, good. And who's got a 60-day growing season? Yeah, we got that, don't we? So that's, that's part of our challenge. Um, we have a lot of options, even within our 60 days. And you're going to have to bear with me. I'm not technical, and she went to get my glasses for me. <laughs> Unless somebody has cheaters they're not using. Um, so this is my farm, and I've been farming here in this super sandy soil. We call it top sand and sub sand. For 25 years in this spot, I've farmed elsewhere in the valley for 15 years. And this is a great spot. It's a low spot, frost settles here, so it's extra cold. It's surrounded by the hills. My house is always five degrees warmer up, in the, up a little, just up 15 feet higher than the fields are. The house is in the trees, the trees protect it. I'm certified organic and this is why. For the future, for our children, for our grandchildren, this is why we're organic. Um, this farm shows you, a, this photo of the farm shows you a little bit of the diversity that creates our particular um, spot here. What you see in the front is a couple of beds of flowers, one more naked bed that's about to get flowers. Fla the flowers being there help with pollinators. We always have something flowering. We usually have a cover crop flowering. Um, but that really, that just helps tremendously with beneficial insects and, and pollinators. Peas do great where we are. Most peas are susceptible to something called a pea weevil, a pea seed weevil, and finding, growing pea seed, you, one reason you have trouble finding organic pea seeds is most regions of this country have too much pea seed weevil to be able to grow peas for seeds, so it's really hard to do organically. We happen to be very fortunate. I don't have pea seed weevil. Yes? Is that like, when I say the pea and there's a little... There's a hole bored in it? That's pea seed weevil, yeah. And theoretically, you can kill them by putting them in the freezer. But theory and reality aren't always the same thing. Tell the weevil that. Um, so I'm going to tell you stories today, because I believe every farm has a story, every plant has a story. And the stories are what make them interesting and what make them the plant that people love. Um, so my first story is going to be about peas. Creston, which is the number one um, soils in the state, is uh, a traditional farming community where seed wasn't purchased, seed was passed down. And there was peas called Creston peas. Nobody really knew what they were. They were probably a, a telegraph or tall um, uh, uh, alderman type pea. And people just pass them down from generation to generation. Within the community, within the family, within the church group was really big in Creston for pea seed. And a lot of that's been lost. And that's part of the reason we do what we do is because we believe in, in growing seeds that are particular for a community, be it Creston, which is a little bit warmer and a little bit richer soil than a lot of us have. Um, so we grow a pea called sumo for seed. Uh, sumo is an uh, Australian variety, even though it's called sumo, <laughs> but it is an Australian variety. It's a snow pea. It's a purple and fuchsia blossomed snow pea that gets about six feet tall, produces, 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 
and it disappeared from availability. We had a little bit left, so we've been multiplying out sumo peas since then. And it is hands down the best snow pea there is. They get big, they get fat, they get wonderful. But that's our responsibility, is to keep going with these seed varieties and not let them disappear as much as we cannot. Uh, this says here that we grow too many varieties. That's what that number is. It says too many. <laughs> and what else we do um, with, with the farm? We don't grow just seeds. This picture here, I kind of like because it shows you in this bottom photo here, there's a pumpkin, there's a spaghetti squash, and on top there, there's a, uh, a yellow patty pan. They all cross with one another. So if it makes it challenging to grow seeds for these. They have to be isolated um, by tunnel or they have to be hand pollinated and sealed shut. They're, it's, it's not hard, it just takes time and energy. But if you want to grow them all, and if you don't want to grow them all, that's why we have seed companies, because somebody is growing them for you. But um, also, you see a red curry and a gold nugget, and they would cross. Um, up there, we do cucumbers. And we do two varieties of cucumber seed, and we grow 12 varieties of cucumbers. And they're probably one of the more promiscuous plants there is after squash. And we do that, and you'll see some high tunnels and hoop houses and things. We do it by isolation. Um, and we're going to come to a little more on that. You can see a high tunnel in the back there. And then I just wanted to mention in the picture there, Ben is harvesting some lettuce heads. And lettuce is not promiscuous. You can grow it 100 feet apart and grow a couple of different kinds of lettuce. But we're going to start talking about selection now, because that's what this, shop, this workshop's about. It's lettuces. When you want to cut a head of lettuce, you don't want it to be bolted. You want to sell lettuce heads or eat lettuce heads. You want them to be sweet and tender and crisp and hold in the field. Because if you go ahead and plant all your lettuces out you know, on May 4th, you're going to have most of all your lettuces ready on June 15th. Like, who eats you know, 20 heads of lettuce in a day? I like lettuce, but... So you want lettuces that don't bolt, which is contrary to saving seed for lettuce. Because you, you want, you, bolting means going to seed, but you don't want the earliest ones with lettuce, the earliest seed. So what you want when you're d doing um, lettuce for seed, you want to let your plants that are not sending up centers, you want those to be the ones you save seed from. And then we come to the fact that we live in Northwest Montana and that's hard to do. Because I have tried for, eight years to grow Plato II romaine lettuce as a seed crop, and it doesn't work. It's a wonderful lettuce. It's my favorite romaine lettuce because it doesn't bolt. So that's contrary to a seed grower's needing it to bolt to gather your seeds. So it takes a lot of roguing and selection in the field and a good baseball bat <laughs> because you want to smack that head of lettuce because that'll break it open and then you're seed head can have an easier time of it and come up sooner. So, um, so lettuces, um, I'm part of Triple Divide Seed Co-op. A lot of our growers are down in the Ronan Moise area and they can do a way better job on lettuce than I can. I can do it, I can do it for me. I can do other varieties other than Play-Doh too. There's lots of other varieties, but Play-Doh too, I let them have it down there where they have a longer season. But to make it something that works for us, you need to do things it's like literally get a baseball bat. And I don't smack it out in the left field. I just gently smack it. And uh, so the seed heads um, have an easier time. So that's one way to, to get things going a little bit sooner. In the foreground on the left picture here, you see shallot seeds. And we'll get to those a little bit more um, in, the f in another slide. But the shallot seeds are a variety called Glacier Rose. And Glacier Rose is a selection. They called this workshop breeding. I think of it more as selection. Breeding is when you're doing a little bit more of your own crosses and things like that in there. But a selection is what we, is simpler and it's what we do for our, um, our needs, our climate needs, etc. In the back you see radishes. Um, radishes are a high pressure crop here because of all the canola 
Anybody who's heard me talk knows how I feel about that. I don't make any bones about it. We have a monocrop in our valley and it's bringing a lot of insects in that uh, destroy the brassica family. And um, the, uh, but when you're doing it for seed, it doesn't matter if there's a few flea beetle holes in it. When you, for a, you know, because that's in the leaves, that's not messing with your seed. So um, radishes, as early as they are, at 28 days, to 44 days, depending on the variety of radishes. Again, it's the same thing. You want it to hold in the field a little bit. You don't want to have to harvest them all. So you want to be careful that when you're harvesting your seeds for your radishes, you're not just um, going for the early seeds. You're going for the seeds that, uh, that are from a radish that's been able to hold in the field a little bit longer. And a lot of people will pull a radish and select the roots that they like for shape, color, size, density, flavor. And you can cut a little bit off of the bottom to taste it and then replant it. And then you, um, that's one way to, do, to uh, work with radishes. So radishes, carrots, beets, you can cut up to a third off the bottom of the root and replant it. And that's one way to do some selection process. Onions, you can cut it from the top and then it'll regrow from the top. It, it, it need, onions need their root, but they don't need the top there. You can cut a third off. To check for firmness, to look and see if the rings are red inside. Um, onions, uh, the um, onion family is a, uh, again, it's a somewhat promiscuous family. Shallots and onions will cross. Onions cross within themselves. Um, leeks don't cross with anything but other leeks. <laughs> So, um, and th those are all biennials. So that would make it, um, you can alternate years. You have to save it from one year to the other, but you can alternate years to do more than one variety on those. But if you want to make it, um, if you're looking for earlier, onions are a challenge because onions are a day length sensitive crop. Does everybody know what that means? Okay. Spinach is another day length sensitive crop. Again, we get into that bolting thing with spinach. But if you're growing the wrong onion for your climate, it's not going to make a nice onion, and it's not going to make a nice seed. Um, Walla Walla sweet onions were the standard northern sweet onion variety for our latitude. And if you were south, you grew Vidalias. But the, what the industry start, likes to do, the big industry likes to do, is grow the Walla Wallas from their seed from up north, and then they overwinter them and te dig them and plant them in Texas for the winter. So we're getting Walla Walla onion seed that's not really for our climate at all. So we left Walla Wallas and we went on to Alsa Crags. And that's a um, heirloom Scottish variety. And it is way earlier, way bigger, stores for two months longer. So as a sweet onion, it's, you know, Phenomenal. Choosing that to begin with, yes. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The name? A I L S A C R A I G, but it said Elsa Crag. It's named for a rocky crag in Scotland. But it's a beautiful heirloom. Its nickname is Exhibition. We've had three pounders. You grow those? Yeah, they're good onion. So start with the right variety and then look at it adapting it for your microclimate. You know, you can, you can try Walla Walla, but because the quality of the, of the plants and the seeds has gone downhill, I don't encourage that one particularly. Um, the, uh, so if you're trying to bring an Elsa Craig into a nice tr dried down neck, you want to you want to let it get that, pick the ones that are the best when you take them into storage. And when you replant them the following year, pick the ones that have stored the best, pick the ones that have the best neck dry down. It's all about selection. But you always want to have the, at least 50 plants of whatever you're doing, See if you're seriously trying to select for changes or for, um, you know, for, your, for uh, um, your particular spot. Take at least 50 plants to, so you have a good cross selection so you don't lose other attributes in selecting for one. If you're selecting for the dry necks, 
you don't want to lose the firmness, you don't want to lose the size, you don't want to lose, lose the um, single bulb where some of them will have a, you know, two rings and two sets of rings inside. You don't want to go there. So keep the disease resistance by keeping more than 50 varieties. That's another big important thing because you never know what's going to evolve as you go into it. Okay, this is our challenging climate. Um, we've all seen snow in almost every month but July. We can frost the 4th of July if we have a really clear day. We can have a really hot 95 degree 4th of July. Watch out for the night. Um, but we work with it. We love where we live, so we work with what it gives us. And um, irrigation, overhead irrigation on those zinnias saved those zinnias. I might have lost my first set of blooms for seed, but my next set of blooms I, I had for seed. So record keeping is super important. And the, the workshop was titled Eggplant, so we have this page. But what I want you to see here, and I brought uh, my seed memory with me. This is one page of 30 pages of, of seed inventory. So every year when I go to look at what I have, each one of these columns is a year, but within each column is two columns. And there'll be a number of what I have, what year that seed is, and what I order or grow out more. And if I need more of it, there's a star. And that's not the important part of this for seed saving. What you want to see here is, if you look up at the top, it says pink tomb, and it goes all the way across. Swallow, and it goes all the way across. Um, uh, snowy, uh, Traviata, they quit. EB egg, early black eggplant, that's my baby. Early black egg disappeared. You'll see there's a, there's a space where there wasn't any for a few years. I didn't grow seed for early black egg. I thought I couldn't grow eggplant seed here in Montana, but you can. And then I was at an organic seed alliance conference and ran into a wonderful little seed catalog called Adaptive Seeds. A young couple, high energy, loved saving some of the old heirloom seeds, and they had some EB egg, and they gave me some. And the year they gave it to me, I had a fabulous crop of eggplant seed. Now, when you're growing for seed, you're growing for over maturity. And particularly in an eggplant, that's important because eggplant can be a challenging one to do. Um, if they're immature seed, they're not going to do a doodle. You want those big, slightly tanny brown seeds in there. And if you're, if you're selecting um, for earliness, this is one case where you know, it's not like you're worrying about bolting in it, like you would in lettuce or like you would in um, spinach or something like that. So um, with eggplant, your first chore, if you're selecting for earliness for your climate, is to pick your first ones and have those be your seed. I probably process eight lots of eggplant seed in a season, not because I want the quantity, but because I want them when they're at the right moment. You don't want them when they're too rotten or too big, and then the rodents really like them when they get too big, too. But um, early black egg is, is an heirloom variety. It's a um, smaller Italian variety, so it's, it's the round kind. It gets about, I've, I've had them, the, probably the biggest is about like that. But generally, they're, they're much smaller than that. Size is not consequential to earliness. Um, we do have other threats to eggplant here, and you don't want to Har harbor those threats. They're susceptible to powdery mildew, they're susceptible to flea beetles, they're susceptible to spider mites. Those are some of the big problems with eggplant. But, um, so you want some tolerance to those things. You want them to be able to withstand it and still produce for you. Now, you have to look also at where you're going to be growing it. I grow my eggplant even if I'm not growing it for seed. I grow it in a high tunnel, a hoop house, or a raised bag with a, with a remake cover on it, a row cover on it. Um, that said, do you want to grow it in a hoop house if you, what you really want to do with that seed is grow a plant that's going to grow outside? You're not giving it the same conditions. Well, you really, if you could grow it to seed outside, that would be great. But if you can't, you're a heck of a lot better off growing it out of your own 
uh, hoop house, then you would be buying it from somebody in Central America or in Southern California who's growing it. Um, so look at your options there. Um, another example would be like a Scarlet Nance carrot, which is one of the most common carrots in the world. Those seeds are, you know, you see them in northern catalogs, you see them in all different, uh, uh, everybody's catalog's got one, but very few of the seed is grown in the north. So if you, want to, if you want to do a carrot, a Scarlet Nance can be a very different carrot here than it is in Southern California or in Mexico or in Florida. Um, so you do still want to go with seeds. Grown in your area and taking that back to eggplant, you're way better off doing it inside than you are doing it outside. Now another way to good, get a good jump on the season for, for um, the eggplant is, of course, starting them inside. And starting them inside at the right moment. Um, Planting out a 14-week eggplant is not as appropriate as planting out a 10-week eggplant start. I'm talking about a start. Once it's at 14 weeks, it's going to be pot bounding. You're not going to get the production you want out of it. So you want it. To, you want to time your transplanting to in an eggplant. I would say from seven to 10 weeks is kind of your window of how old a plant you could put out. <coughs> um, so um, selection, selection, selection. Go for the early ones that you find there. Bring in a few that are not so early because you want to keep those other traits of disease resistance. And um, if you want to, uh, and st you know, if, with eggplant, I would suggest um, not trying to dehybridize, sticking with the open pollinated. Are you talking about as far as seven to ten weeks from seed plant or from germination? From, from, oh, if you want to talk about eggplant germination, that could take years. Okay. <laughs> no, it's the most sensitive to plant to, to uh, probably to, from um, seed plant would be okay. And it depends how you treat it, if you start it in a mama and then transplant it. Because I do grow mine. Yeah, 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 and we do ours inside. But the other reason we do them inside is because eggplant is a little promiscuous. And so we need to isolate it. Because we grow so many varieties of eggplant and I only do one for seed. If I were smart, I would do one kind of eggplant, period, but I don't. We grow about, we've cut it back to six varieties of eggplant. So they're all in one, in one hoop house or high tunnel. And then the, the one for seed crop has to be isolated from it. Um, so um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. So uh, the other things you're seeing here is the greenhouse with some of our pepper varieties uh, in their mama trays. And we start, are those in mamas? No, nope. those are in. Uh, so, well, the foreground ones on the peppers are in pots, and behind them, that's a mama tray. We start in everything in a mama tray, and then transplant it out to individual pots, and then transplant it out to its final location. And that kind of toughens them up really well, too. In the lower picture, does anybody know what that is? Buckwheat? Yep. Cover crop. We always throw buckwheat in between our brassicas. We leave wide paths between our, not our brassicas, our cucurbita and we put buckwheat in there, both for pollinators, for, for um, a, uh, attracting um, beneficials, and because it produces so much organic mass in our very sandy soil. This is one of the hoop houses, and this one is uh, tomatillos. And we have our own variety of tomatillo. It is called Purple Blush. It was originally bred out of um, Pueblo Verde and uh, selected is more the key word there again. Um, we found that the purple ones coincidentally were sweeter, um, prolific, hardy. Um, if I move, I move a hoop house every, I have one place where there's a succession of three and one moves each year, so they're in one spot for three years and they have um, tomatillos in them before they get taken down and tomatillo becomes one of my worst weeds. 
Um, it's not a bad weed to have. It pulls pretty easily, and occasionally those weeds produce if you thin them out and treat them like a plant instead of a weed. Um, but purple blush, and I brought some. Um, and these are the rejects. This is what we have left in the cellar now. I just brought a few. These are the smallest ones because, of course, your customers want the biggest. But they have a little purple blush on them. And their flavor's phenomenal. Um, and they keep, obviously, pretty well. I'll make some salsa. Usually in May, I make my last batch of green salsa. Get some peppers out of the freezer, some onions out of the one cellar, this out of another cellar. And um, they're great. And uh, when you touch, touch egg or, uh, tomatillos, they have saponin on them which is their protective coating. Just like quinoa, you would wash quinoa before you use it. When you wash a tomatillo, it gets all sudsy. And that's protecting it. If I don't disturb the paper and I don't wash it, that's why they keep so well, because they're not evaporating out. Um, you also see some row cover here, which is sometimes used as a technique for isolation. You can cover one bed, you know, if you're trying not to let things cross pollinize, you'll cover one bed um, at a time that you're trying to keep isolated, and then you can um, cover others while you've got that uncovered for pollination. So, but you have to watch your timing pretty close if that's your method of isolation, and try and give it as much spacing as possible. So, the selection of the tomatillos was um, started out as an arbitrary trait and then it became a goal. And um, to say that something has acquired or exhibits a trait as, as its distinct feature, you generally have to give it five or six years of knowing that you're seeing that trait re come out more and more frequently. Um, we started down the path of seeds when um, Monsanto bought some minis. I had always grown some seeds, but that was when I got super serious about it because I wasn't going to, I worked too hard for every nickel, let me tell you, and I'm not going to give any of those dang nickels to Monsanto. So we lost 100 varieties of our 500 that year. That's a pretty big number, because, not because they became unavailable, but because I refused to buy them because they were now Monsanto. Some of those were hybrids. I believe that there is a place for hybrids. A carefully bred hybrid is a great thing. Um, I do not do my own hybridizing, but I do my own dehybridizing. So um, we tried dehybridizing a pumpkin called Snack Jack. They called it Snack Jack. And I got pretty good at it. Um, the reason I like Snack Jack, again, it was a single trait selection, was that Snack Jack had a naked hulled seed so you could just eat the pumpkin seeds without having the hulls on them. A very prolific producer of them, and it was early. Most of the naked hulled seeded pumpkins, Lady Godiva, I can't do those. But Snack Jack was small and early, and I could do it, and it was so delicious. And the pumpkins were only this big, but there was probably a quarter pound of seed in each one. But that picture I showed you in the beginning <coughs> of all the squashes that, that tend to cross, pumpkin's one of them. So it was super hard to do, and we isolated that with, because I'm a market grower also, I have to offer diverse selection to my customers. And so um, I tried covering the um, snack jacks and keeping them, keeping them isolated from, they cross with all the summer squash, other pumpkins, spaghetti squash, and um, at about year five, I was at 80% naked hulled seed in the dehybridization process, and at year six, it dropped back to about 35. So and with the dehybridization, it's even more questionable because you never know what traits are going to appear. My, it had changed shape a little bit, and I didn't care about it changing shape a little bit because my goal was not a pretty pumpkin. My goal was seed. This is Carlo. Okay, this is where that story comes in. Carlo's my, um, Carlo's my true love. Um, generally pretty, pretty faithful. Um, Carlo peppers are a semi-sweet, semi-hot, Hungarian type or gypsy pepper, whatever you want to call them. They're a pointed pepper. They're gorgeous. They get about this long. I get 
two dozen peppers from a, from a Carlo plant without any problem. More, a little bit less, a little bit more, but generally in that. They were early, they were delicious, they were thick walled, they roasted and peeled, fabulous. They were early, um, and we called them Kid Strength Chiliano peppers, and did I mention they were really early? Yeah, that's always important for us, right? So I was growing Carlo in the 80s. That would be the last century. And um, they were a Garden City Seed variety. Garden City Seed was out of Missoula, the Bitterroot. And I found out they weren't going to have them anymore. And so um, I was really bummed. And, what, and this was my first seed foray, um, maybe my second, but first real one. And I had planted my, all my peppers in one hoop house together. And there were no more seeds going to be available, and I had no more seeds. And I loved these peppers. And peppers are, I'll use the word again, they are promiscuous. They cross very readily. And I hadn't isolated them, but I saved seeds anyways. And in saving those seeds, I got one heck of a mishmash the next year. But from 1985 till about tw 2002, maybe, I was reselecting and reselecting and reselecting for the things I wanted, which was the earliness, the thick walls, the flavor being sweet and hot, and the flavor is what you find the most crosses, which has advantages in other places. But um, so by about 2002, I was in an Organic Seed Alliance conference. And I was talking to George Moriarty, who's a breeder at Cornell. Cornell is one of the biggest vegetable breeding um, colleges we have in this country. And um, he said, I think I know what you want. I was pretty there. I was pretty there with what I wanted. It was coming out really true. I was pretty happy with it. I was marketing the peppers, but not the seeds yet. And he said, I can take it, and I can run it in our greenhouse. I can run it in our greenhouse down in Central America in the second part of the I can get you three years in a year and I'll get you totally tight. And I was pretty excited about that. And when I got the seed back the following year, I planted some that I had that I thought was some of my best seed and I planted some of his and I stupidly put them next to each other. And George came up with nothing like what I wanted. It was a nice pepper, but it was thin walled, it was small, it was too hot, it wasn't, it might have been early. I didn't even pay attention to it. So then I had to start over again. But I was closer. And, and in doing that, so here's a, here's a hoop house that's got a bed of probably 50 of his and 50 of my peppers. I took them from the furthest from the, from the other peppers. So if you have to do that, you always go to the furthest if you have to be near another one. Because those little bugs aren't going to work any harder than they have to. So they'll just go to the next plant over. You know, it's something that corn growers know too about spacing corn and putting something in between. That, that's like a block in between that's going to do it for the bugs. So um, we've now had Carlo peppers on the market for 10 years, and they are very consistent. I, I got them back in a couple of years because it wasn't that bad. But it could have potentially been 25 years down the drain. But, um, um, and I'm not saying against him, he just didn't, wasn't in my head. He didn't know what I was looking for. So, um, <coughs> Carlos are a great pepper. They're prolific, they taste good, they're thick walled, and they're early. So, selection of variety is super important. And then, selecting from within that variety, when we do our Carlos now, and I probably do a few pounds a year of seed of Carlos. Uh, not a ton or anything because pepper seed's kind of small and people don't go through a ton of it. Um, I take from lot one, first harvest, for my earliness. And I make sure I keep some lot two and lot three. I might not keep all five lots or six lots or whatever lots we have that year. But I definitely keep more than one lot, even if it's not what I'm growing. Because if there's a problem, I want to go to a different lot. That might and, a, and early lots can mean the earliest peppers off of each plant, or it can be the plants that produce the peppers the earliest. You can separate them, you can do them to mix together, but that's, but early it can be done in two ways that way, you know. And you want that, because you want that diversity of your gene pool. 
You don't want to limit all the other aspects that are coming out of um, th that are you know coming out of your plants. You want to have a good uh, selection to choose from. You don't have to do them if you want to do more than one pepper. You don't have to do them every year. Um, the seeds hold well enough. Your germination rate does drop a little bit. But if you want to be, if you have one way to one house or one way to isolate, and you want to do more than one variety, alternate years. Don't you know? And also, uh, one thing I want to caution people: if you use, if you grow a lot of different peppers or eggplants or tomatoes or anything that you're growing from a transplant, if you are transplanting out plants into an isolation and they've been mingled in the greenhouse, pinch off those earliest blossoms. The earliest ones are fickle anyways. If they're produced on a um, potted plant, they're just a uh, screaming for attention thing in a potted plant. So um, you're not, you're not going to get a good crop out of that anyways. You're not going to want them. So it's not a big loss. Pinch off those flowers because they could be cross-pollinated with something else in the greenhouse. And that's, it doesn't take long. You just got to remember to do it. Tomatillos. This is a um, 13 wide by six foot tall hoop house. Can you see what they're doing in there? They're reaching the ceiling. Um, and we grow for production in the hoop house anyway, so I don't mind our seeds coming out of the hoop house for this particular one. Like I said, they sometimes will be wild outside, and I always save seed from the ones that are you know, wild outside ones if it, if it gets to that stage. Um, they tend to be lovely. They tend to produce, the wild outside ones for some reason produce the biggest tomatillos. Um, it is to market things early if you're doing seed because if you're choosing your earliest ones for seed, then you're not gonna get your earliest ones to the market necessarily. So it's, it's, it's weighing what you do with what's important to you. So this jungle is um, not the foreground, that's different, but the, what you see all very drooping and dramatic and graceful looking is a crop called spinach everlasting. And that's another selection of ours. Spinach is a day length sensitive crop. We do grow spinach for seed, standard spinach. We grow a giant winter spinach for seed. Um, and it's that juggle with your regular spinach, your standard spinach, do I, you know, harvest the early seeds, but I don't really want the early seeds because the early seeds are coming from plants that are bolting early. And I, in spinach, you don't want that early bolt. You want it to hold in the field and not bolt. So you don't harvest those early seeds. You go, you wait until you've got later, you know, rogue those plants out, harvest them, use the leaves on them, get them out of the field, and leave your later crops in the field to produce the seed. If you get your spinach out early enough, you're going to get seed out of it anyways. You can transplant spinach for a seed crop. It, it does make sense sometimes. It stresses it, though. When you're talking about a leafy plant, it tends to stress it when you transplant it. So it might bolt out a little bit sooner. But that's a stress bolt, not a, not a uh, genealogy bolt. Um, so that's not so bad. But this crop here, spinach everlasting, um, it's truly a chard. Chard and spinach are kissing cousins, and um, chard is just a biennial form of spinach. They're in the same family. So this is a biennial. So first year in the field, you're not going to get any bolt. So it's a great mid-season spinach crop. Your early spinach, it's nice to throw it out and have it grow really fast. Your late spinach doesn't, because the days are shorter. It's not so bad, but for mid-season, there's a, usually a blank spot in spinach production for marketing spinach. And this fills it really well. It gets big, it does get big like a chard. When it gets really big, I have used it in bunches. But um, if you harvest it young, it tastes way more like spinach than chard. It's got a little more density, nice flavor. My restaurants love it, because when you cook it, there's actually still something there. You know, how many pounds of spinach does it take to make a meal, right? And, and uh, chard is a little bit better that way. So it, this is a um, biennial. Um, I cannot reliably grow chard for seed because it is biennial and it's hard to pull and replant. 
um, beets we can pull and replant, which are also the same family and will cross-pollinate. But this one holds in the field way better over the winter. Now, if you're growing a biennial and you want it to overwinter, you don't want to put it, you don't want to start it quite as early as you would start it for growth. Because um, particularly with a leafy plant, you want it to hold over in the field and not in a huge stage. You want it kind of small. So what we generally do is plant it, harvest away at it so the leaves are staying small and the, and the growing points are not getting big and um, keep it well harvested when it, before it goes into uh, winter. And I can't tell you that every year with the biennial works, but with this particular one, most years, it holds over in the field. And we get a little production in this. You can grow it for spring production, or you can grow it for, for biennial seed production. Um, but again, like Hans was saying, you want to keep your seed. Because if you get into a winter that's super, super cold without much snow cover, that's when you're going to lose it. If you get into a winter where there's a lot of snow cover, and they're still really nice and green under there where you've had a heavy rodent year, they're going to burrow around under the snow and they're going to eat the tops off of your plants. And you're not going to get a lot of survival. But as you can see with that plant, I think you should be able to see, it's loaded with seed. It's totally loaded with seed. Um, it's happy. It was, when that particular, I remember this crop because I can tell by the location of it. When we harvested this crop, it was, wintry mixing on us. And the crop was still not totally dried down. Um, and it was time to get it out of there. And we tried to build some kind of a shelter. I had some help that day and we tried to build some kind of a shelter to work under. Because having all the moisture of the wintry mixing with it was not going to do it any good in drying down. Um, standard spinach. You've got to watch for that bolting factor and balance the bolting factor with the seed production factor. Get it out early. Get it out really early in the summer. Spinach can take, if you can get in the ground, you can plant spinach. So if, if you want to do that, get it out early and select your seeds from not your first crops. Get, and, and rogue them. Roguing means pulling them out. Harvest them, then pull them out so that you don't confuse your seed from the, from the ones you don't want with the ones you do want. You know, I'm into using everything, so I don't just immediately rogue and call it, you know, because I'm selling the spinach leaves too. But make sure that you're, you know which it is. You can use um, flags and mark in the fields the ones that you really like or the ones that you don't like if there's more likes and don't likes. But um, pay attention to what you're doing there. Um, and again, go with most spinaches, most annual spinaches are hybrids that um, have that have uh, bolt resistance. But the Giant Winter has been a really good one to us. Um, I've liked that one a lot. There's another one that um, John Navazio bred um, abundant, and it took, because Abundant Life was what Organic Seed Alliance started out as, Abundant Life Seed Foundation, and then um, Abundant Spinach is, is the one, another nice OP that he's bred. Oh, I, mean, I brought John Navazio's book, if anybody wants to look at it. This is a great uh, seed-saving Bible type book, The Organic Seed Grower. It's got a lot of information. We have a lot of missing information in vegetable seed production, a whole lot of missing information. We have a whole lot of varieties that disappear. And, um, and I mean, I, got, I contracted to grow three types of um, gem marigolds one year. And there was absolutely zero information, even from the contract buyer, from everybody I talked to in the seed industry, if they would cross-pollinate. Nobody knew. And it's just missing information, and more so in the flowers than in the vegetables. But All right, this is Zaire. It's a bread seed poppy. Zaire is from northern Russia. It does well here. How many tomato varieties do we grow from Russia? A lot. Russia, the Russians, the, that, that part of the world has been at it a lot longer than we have. This, you know, we have brought, these are not native here, so they were brought over from other places where they've been growing longer. And it's good to look at your sources that way. Um, I love Zaire. It's, uh, 
beautiful flower, as you can see. Um, and that's big. I'll show you in the next slide. That's big. I want to show you more here first, though. Um, it's, it's very sweet, the seeds are, so we sell it for culinary use. And um, the pods, the seed pods, most um, poppies, by the time they reach about like this one in the middle with the, that's a little bit tanner with the spots on it, the vents start to open. Makes it very hard to save the seed. I love this one. The vents never open. Well, um, I'm going to go on to more poppies. In the background there, you're seeing yellow blooms, and that is calendula, another crop we do. And I'm just learning that calendula is possibly going to be used as a fiber plant like, like hemp. And why is that good for us to hear? Calendula will be wonderful through November. It's so cold hardy. It's a great plant. We do it for seed. It doesn't get great germination. You always have poor germination rates out of calendula. But if it's a big, beautiful plant that lasts well into cold weather, that'd be a great, you know, like flax used to be here. That shows you how big the pods are on these. Um, and they have a fair bit of seed in them. They're, they're just a great variety. and. Um, Again, we've been just keep selecting, you know, obviously at the end of the season, they're not as frost tolerant as the calendula at the end of the season. They're going to be, um, the ones that are left are the ones that don't make it. So you're not going to be saving those anyways. You're going to be saving the ones that do make it. It's pretty simple. What's the name of those? Z-A-I-R. Sometimes you'll see it with an E on the end. Z like zoo? Yep. Zaire bread seed poppy, and we do have them through Triple Divide, and a lot of the other catalogs have them too. Yeah, they, they, and they interbreed, don't they? Poppies? Yeah, my neighbor has those that have been growing in her property for the last, she said, <coughs> 60 years. They volunteer. Yeah. They're not perennial, they're an annual that volunteers. Yeah. yeah, they're, yeah. Hardy, they're very hardy, and they don't like to be transplanted. I do transplant some, and I do direct seed some every year and pretty much the direct seed catches up with the transplant. Every year it's just my own stubbornness that makes me transplant them. So what we're looking at here, the picture on the left, is radish seed production, harvesting onto, um, onto uh, a tarp there. Um, we don't always get to dry down. Um, in, in the field around here, we get fall rain, and it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, How do you get the radish seeds out easily, quickly? Good music. <laughs> good music. You dance on them. <laughs> and if the music's better, it's, it's more fun. <laughs> well, they're really tough with a really sharp end when they're dry. I don't go barefoot. <laughs> I have a pair of Crocs just for stomping seed that we keep in the seed house. And you know what? Crocs fit almost any foot. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the simplest thing is just to do that. And they're very firm, hard seed. And so they don't damage too easily. If you do stomp on them, the fact that they're round doesn't helps in that department also. Um, and that works with kale with anything in the brassica family pretty much, unless you're doing a lot of quantity and then you're looking at a seed thresher or something like that. But, and then on the right we have Glacier Rose shallots. So Glacier Rose was, was originally called Prisma. Prisma was a hybrid. It was not Monsanto, I didn't mind, it came out of uh, Holland. And Holland grows a lot of seeds. A lot of the seed industry is out of Holland. In this country, it's mostly out of the Pacific Northwest, the Olympic Peninsula, particularly biennial production like, like a shallot. But <coughs> Prisma just became unavailable. And we knew it was going to become unavailable um, a year prior. So I saved my best shallots, and I planted them again. Now, some shallots you multiply by replanting the bulb, and some you do from seed. This is a seed shallot. It goes from seed to shallot in one year. 
but then a second year to get back to seed. It's still biennial, but it's not um, bulb to bulb. And um, so I started selecting, selecting, selecting. And it actually went really well. I got really lucky this time. And within about um, seven or eight years, we had a product we could market. It was a reliable shallot. Um, it still is. Uh, and it was early. It was a great keeper. It still is. And it's just been a, um, a cornerstone in our seed production for us. Uh, I love the shallots, I love the seeds. I've had some interesting phenomenons appear where if I, if I just harvest the seed off and don't cultivate the field, I'll see the third year, the bulbs will pr start producing seed again, which is kind of interesting. And I haven't found any difference in that seed from the other seed. I did save some seed and do a companion, a side-by-side -side trial on it. Um, but it was just a matter of selecting the ones that really held well over the winter. Um, they got bigger. Um, which may be an onion trait because shallots cross with onions, so it may be an onion trait coming out in the shallot that made them get bigger, but they didn't lose their flavor, they didn't lose their production, they didn't lose their texture. Now, we did have a crop failure last year, both in seed and bulb. It was not a warm year, if you all recall. It was a pretty cool year. But, um, so we, had, we uh, had very little seed available. It was really hard not to be able to meet contract, but I wanted to keep everything so that I could you know, uh, grow, grow the crop again. But sh there hasn't been another good shallot out there other than the um, Prisma for so long that when we lost Prisma, I didn't have a choice. I had to, gr I had to try growing it out. And I feel that way um, still. I feel like it is the responsibility, the privilege, and the duty of every farmer to, to steward at least a couple of varieties of seeds, grow them, improve them if you can, get them, to, get them to where they're good in our climate. We no longer have the land-grant universities like we used to. So um, they exist, but they don't really work with us vegetable growers a whole lot. So it's really important that we take it into our own hands and that we do it. So any questions about what we've talked about or any other crops that we might want to? Yeah? Um, you said you were growing calendula. Mm -hmm. Have you had problems with like, black beetles? Yeah, those are, that? that's an um, alfalfa beetle. <laughs> Aren't they disgusting? You squeeze them and they ooze orange. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but one way to control those they like orange, right? Uh -huh. Yellow and orange. If you can get a hold of a yellow five gallon bucket and put water in it about two thirds of the way up, they can just go into that bucket because it's yellow and they can't get out. And where can we buy your seeds? Um, we sell a lot of our varieties through Triple Divide, okay. which is the Montana co-op. Um, we sell through Botanical Interest and Fedco and a number of other places. I don't do direct sales. The closest to direct sales would be through Triple Divide. It's our co-op. <coughs> All right. Good deal. No more questions? All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that's been helpful.